we're gonna, I know it's afternoon, it's a little warm in here, I think, and we're gonna do health law. Woo um, a whole lot of health law in a very short period of time. And I don't know if I get 30 minutes added to the five I have here on my clock, but we'll let you decide that. Yes, are you gonna reset? Okay, good. Okay, so I love Sherry. She said, would you please do HIPAA and Tala Stark and anti-kickback in 30 minutes? I said, sure, <laughs> what not a problem. No, I wanna give you a good review. I wanna give you a review on some of these. Um, I wanna start with HIPAA. HIPAA is the amount of misunderstanding of HIPAA absolutely floors me. And by the way, it's because, well, it goes all the way back to the beginning. All the way back to the beginning, when HIPAA was first passed, 1996 it was passed, but it didn't really come into effect to 2003, when all of a sudden everyone's worried about this HIPAA law, it was, in many cases, deliberately misinterpreted. And I hate to tell you this, it was deliberately misinterpreted by people who had something to sell. So there was all sorts of HIPAA hype that got started way back in the beginning, and it is almost impossible to kill these rumors. They're like urban myths. But I want you to know something. I used to work extensively for the Texas Medical Association, and I love them. And the TMA sent me to Washington three times so I could listen to the people who actually wrote the law. I got an unofficial title at TMA. I'm, I was, I, I'm known as the HIPAA goddess. So I promise you, that was my name that I made up, but anyhow, um, I promise you what I'm gonna tell you in the next couple of minutes, I'm not making this up. I will give you the absolute definitive resource to double check what I tell you and to double check all the bad HIPAA information you hear in the future. But with that as an opening, let me ask you, do you know what the best HIPAA humor is? Do you know why we got HIPAA? to make it easier for you to share information. <laughs> yeah, I kid you not, how'd that go? Do you know what that, well, th that's what this law was for? This law was for you, it was to facilitate the appropriate sharing of patient information. What was envisioned way back when, and this started with the first Bush presidency, and I'm talking about the father, not the son, but what was envisioned is this wonderful world where you were going to be in the emergency department and immediately, without any hesitation, any information you needed to give the very best possible, efficient, safe, quick information would be right there. It was gonna be fabulous. And then we got HIPAA. So this law has been grossly misinterpreted grossly misinterpreted. So let me just get rid of some of those rumors right now. I want to spend a moment here in particular because just, it was last week or the week before, I can't remember the exact date, they just released the HIPAA omnibus bill, which is HIPAA all over again. So all these, I'm hearing the same rumors I heard back in 2004. So much misinformation, but let me tell you a little bit and then let me give you that resource as promised. Now, what I'm going to say, in, uh, uh, in order for this to be true, what I'm about to say to be true, you have to have all the HIPAA preliminaries in place, and by the way, that's my, not my title, it's not in the law, but you have to have a privacy officer, you have to have policies and procedures, and you have to have a notice of privacy practice, that has to be posted. You have to have business associate agreements, you have to, all of this. You don't have to worry about this. This has been dealt with by your facility, whether you're a freestanding ED or your hospital, whatever. This has been taken, this was taken care of almost 10 years ago. But you have all these precautions put in place and you are now releasing information or asking for information that's released on treatment, payment, or operations. Treatment is anything you could possibly need to know to get the best possible information to care for your patient. One of the problems here, of course, is you only can be as good a physician as your information is. If you don't have good information, how good a physician can you be? So anything that you need to know for treatment of a patient, you absolutely have access to. Payment and operations, those are more on the level of administration. So you need to know something for treatment. Um, you're not the ones who are the HIPAA problem. The HIPAA problem are the people in the community, right? 
I was speaking to a woman in um, Austin, Texas. She's an emergency room physician. And she had a patient roll into her ED who was hemorrhaging. And she really needed to know, wanted to know if the woman was taking anticoagulants. So they contacted the, the patient's primary care provider. And the, emergency, the ED doctor said, is this, patient ta is this woman taking anticoagulants? And the office said, I'm sorry, we can't tell you. How many of you have had that answer? Thank you. We can't tell you. We don't have a signed release form from the patient. And they wouldn't give on it. So believe it or not, this woman told me she actually had a pen. She wedges a pen into the hand of the woman who is hemorrhaging, has her scratch her name on a HEPA release form, faxes it to the office, and 45 minutes later, after an appropriate review, the office answered the question. That's nonsense. That is exactly what the law was meant to prevent. So what I'm telling you is as long as that office has all those preliminaries in place on the doctor's office side, and here you're on the phone, and you need information for treatment, they give it up without any questions answered. By the way, they don't need the patient's permission. They don't need the patient's signature. Why is that? How many of you have gone to your own doctor and you see this huge big thing called the Notice of Privacy Practices and they say, here, sign here, you know that thing? Do you know that what that said, if anyone ever read one, what it says is, yes, I have now been put on notice that you will in the future release any information of mine in your possession for purposes of treatment payment operations without further notice. So you don't have to ask the patient's permission. You don't have to get a signature. They already gave it to them. So here you are, you're just trying to give great care, and the office is holding back information where the whole system was meant to get that information to you more quickly. There's only one exception to that, and it's only a small exception, really, but that is a, a mental health care record small in your world, but a mental health care, the most highly protected records we have are mental health care records for obvious and important reasons. What's interesting is people don't know what a mental health care record is. Pretend for a second you're all family physicians. How many of you would have patients that had mental health care issues? Postpartum depression, depression ADHD, anxiety, whatever it is, right? A lot of your patients. You as, as family physicians, internal medicine, pediatrics, they're all the time they're prescribing anti, antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicines, Ritalin, whatever, right? Are any of those records mental health care records? No. The de the mental, a mental health care record has nothing to do with the content of the record. It is entirely dependent on the licensure of the person writing the note. A mental health care record is a record created by either a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a licensed counselor. They did not include psychiatric nurse practitioners, and shame on them, they should have. So here you are in the ED, you have any question, any question at all to an internal medicine physician, a cardiologist, a family physician, whatever, if they say, I can't tell you that's mental health care information, they're wrong. They can tell you. Now, if you're calling a psychiatrist, that is a different world. But again, I just, it's all supposed to be this free flow of information. One of my favorite quotes from the law, you are free to engage in the communications as required to, for quick, effective, and high quality health care, period. HIP is a floor, not a ceiling. And what that means is every single state was allowed, it's, the, a state law cannot be less stringent than the federal law, but it can go higher. So some states have put in more protections for privacy. Um, California is a very a, a famous one, but a lot of states have. That's fine. I do not pretend to know all 50 state laws about privacy, but I promise you there isn't a law in this country 
that would weigh patient safety less important than patient privacy. This patient's privacy is locked down tight. Thank you. He's dead, but man, do we protect his privacy. So you and the ED, everyone should be talking to you. You should never have any, because by definition, you're in an emergency room, okay? So you should be able to get the information like this if you ever did need to talk to a, a, a psychiatrist, psychologist, counselor, um, um, licensed, um, uh, uh, excuse me, nurse practitioner, psychiatric nurse practitioner, then they do need to get a signature. I'm not saying you can't get that information either. Okay, why has this law gotten so crazy? Because no one wants to go to jail, right? How many of you are told that if you break HIPAA, it's jail, $25,000 or $250,000? Y'all yeah, were, I know you were, thank you. Everyone was. You wanna know what the penalties are if you break HIPAA? $100, period, $100. And I'm talking about, it's a good faith thing. You, let's say you call, okay, you call the doctor and you say, I need to know if this patient's taking anticoagulants. And the doctor's office answers. But uh-oh, it turns out you aren't really the ED, you're the nosy neighbor. Okay, they just broke HIPAA. They gave information over the phone and it was an undisclosed, it was, it was an inappropriate disclosure. A hundred bucks, period. So what happens is the patient, the, pa the patient can't sue you under HIPAA, by the way, but they turn you into the government and the government comes and they knock on your door and they go, you broke HIPAA and you're supposed to give them a hundred bucks. They've been getting about a thousand complaints a week in Washington since this law started hundreds and thousands of complaints. To date, how many people have paid that $100 penalty? No one. No one. Do you know that people are literally dying because of this law? Colorado, young man, mid-50s, a baby in my book, okay? Backyard, barbecuing drops with a sudden cardiac event. Two problems. They can't see him from the street. He has a privacy fence, and it's one of those old neighborhoods that doesn't post street numbers. You know those? So the ambulance is in the neighborhood, and they're trying to find this guy. Can't find, neighbors are coming out of their house saying to the ambulance, if you just tell us who it is, we can find them. Three times the ambulance contacts a dispatcher. We need a name. Sorry, can't give you a name on open airwaves. By the time they found that guy, he was literally stiff, non-resuscitatable. I say this law killed him. But you see how crazy it is? So it's 100 bucks, okay? Now, if you're selling information for malicious reasons or personal gain, you get to go to jail, fine. You're not criminals. I have this rule, criminals don't show up for all day seminars. I'm very, you know. Okay, it's, it's worked pretty well. Now, it is true the HIPAA became a half a million dollar crime, but again, you're not criminals. So under the ARA, the Recovery Act, it is true that now we have tiers of penalties and um, you can get a half, you know, this huge, big, you know, whatever, fine. But what I want to point out to you is that $100 penalty never changed. You're doing the best you can. Mistakes might happen. But I strongly suggest the next time anyone says to you, I can't tell you because of HIPAA, here's what you do. Okay, 50 bucks, I'm in for half. <laughs> tell me what I need to know. Okay? I mean, it's craziness because, by the way, that well, wrongful death suit is going to cost a lot more than 50 bucks. All right. Now, there is a new HIPAA poster child, and I got to love this guy, but there's a gentleman in Arizona who very recently, this is in the fall, uh, that I think they found him, but recently he was brought down um, by, by, by the uh, HIS. He had to pay $100,000. He's a surgeon who is posting his surgery schedule on a completely unprotected website. Date, name of patient, procedure being done, I mean, really? 
So he's now paying more money. But may I point out, he's not, I mean, I'm, I'm, you, for you, it's just those innocent mistakes, right? They found out all sorts of other things, too. He, he had never, he, had, he couldn't even spell HIPAA. He'd never done any of that stuff. So yeah, he's, he got in trouble. Okay. So yes, HIPAA is the gift that keeps on giving. They're coming out with this omnibus rule, but I promise you the bottom line, trust your gut. If it's a patient safety issue, no one should be denying you that information. Um, and this is the resource. I call it the HIPAA Truth Buster. You are one click on your computer away from the undeniably accurate information about what you can and cannot do about HIPAA. The government, to their credit, has been answering frequently asked questions on this website. The reason I love this website, by the way, it's easy to search. You just put in what you want to need to know, and the answer will come up. It's written in English, not legalese. So there'll be a question. The first word of every answer will be, you know, can I do this? Yes. Can I do this? No. Unless it's grammatically inappropriate. With a very brief English explanation of why that's true. So when the, pay, when the office won't give you the information you need to know, you don't have to take my word for it. Just go to there and forward, you know, just say, okay, I'm going to clip and paint. It's from the government. Give me your email address. I have something I want to share with you. Okay? So that's the truth buster. Oh, by the way, when you read through the questions, last time I looked, if you printed it up, it would be like 500 pages. They call it the frequently asked questions, but I love going there because some of those questions are so stupid. It is not possible two people thought of them. So I think they're answering any question, any question at all. All right. So I leave that with you a little bit more heavy on HIPAA today, but it is going to become all the more crazy because of this omnibus rule. But please, please, please do not fall for all those silly HIPAA myths as long as you're appropriately sharing information for the purposes of safe, efficient, quality care, you're, you're, you're really okay. And that's true, by the way, whether it's an electronic transaction, an oral communication, a written record, it was all meant to make it easier to share patient information for the purposes of patient care. Okay, harder to get laughs out of kickbacks, but very important. That is the legal definition of a kickback Basically, you're getting something of value in exchange for prescribing a certain medication, filling a hospital bed, using a certain hip. Um, emergency room physicians don't get many opportunities, right? You never get hit up for kickbacks. My husband's a pediatrician. No one wants him either. We all know who the heavy hitters are, the people who are really getting hit with a lot of inappropriate um, suggestions are more likely to be surgeons, orthopedic surgery. There's other fields that get hit with these uh, illegal um, requests all the time. But again, it's important to know. Now that's the legal definition. Um, I do a lot of resident education, love teaching residents. I do a course with a very good friend of mine who's an ophthalmologist, and it's for people who are just getting out of their residency program. And so what I, um, through Southern Medical Association. So um, here's what I tell them. I say to them, look, that's the, the first is the legal definition of a kickback. Here's all you have to remember. If you ever, ever, ever hear yourself think the words, wow, what a deal, be scared. Be scared. I mean, if you're, it, it, it's just, if, it's, if, if someone's offering you something exciting enough that you remember to tell your loved one at the end of the day, it's probably a little slippery. All right? There should not be much happiness in the world, I'm sorry. But if someone's offering you something too good to be true, it's too good to be true. Accepting or offering a kickback is a felony, not a word you want on your resume. Okay? A felony is an offense punishable by death or imprisonment for more than a year. We're not killing people yet, but I'm so sorry. I have to, when we start, Texas will be the first. I'm from Texas. Texas will be number one. Okay. Now, you know, it's, it's scary stuff. Now, they have to prove that you knew what you were doing is illegal. There is a requirement that if you're going to go to jail, they have to show intent. But I want to warn you, they're playing with that. 
They're playing with intent. They're actually trying to make it easier to find criminal liability, and that is far exceeds the 16 minutes I have left. But let me just tell you, even predating the Affordable Care Act, um, and in the Affordable Care Act, and in another law called FARA, FARA is actually the law to stop Wall Street abuses, they're starting to say that um, they're, they're playing with the criminal intent. Just so you know, um, I'll finish that thought in case you're wondering what I'm referring to. It's called the 60-day affirmative duty to disclose. But just so you know, that intent, they're trying to make it easier, promise you, not harder, to find criminal liability. So remember, you never, ever, ever, ever want to hear yourself saying, wow, yeah. People can offer you something that's fair market value. Fair market value, of course, is like pinning jello to the wall. You know, everyone, no one seems to have a great definition for it. I just say it's a gut check. There's fair market value, a, a fair market value, and then there's not. Two quick stories. I was doing a, a three-hour lecture on, on kickbacks, not a 30-minute multi-lecture. And there was a woman in the room who got physically, visibly upset, and her hand shot up. She goes, I think I'm in trouble. And I said, oh, please talk to a lawyer who's not on stage in a microphone, but anyhow. But she was very generous, and she told us she's a, ger uh, a, a geriatrician, and she is the uh, medical director for a local nursing home. And she's getting money from them, a fairly good, you know, fairly nice, nice sum of money for, for taking this position. But the more she talked, um, what she told us is this, us as the audience, she had a written contract. The contract made it very clear what duties she was expected to fulfill as a medical director. In order for her to fulfill those very specific duties, it was going to take her about 10 hours a week of her time. All her patients, by the way, were at that nursing home, but it's because, first of all, she thought they were the best nursing home in town, which is why she agreed to be the medical director in the first place. And secondly, she has fabulous access. She's there 10 hours a week. But very importantly, the amount of money they were giving her was a fair market value of her time times 10 hours times a whole year. Got it? As opposed to, now I do not know the details of this case and I wish I could find it because I love this. It was an anecdote told to me um, uh, about an investigation. It involved a hospital who wanted to make all the doctors in town happy. You know how hospitals want to make doctors happy so they can get all the patients. So believe it or not, this hospital thought if we can get all the doc, we'll let every single doctor in town get rid of their obnoxious patients. Every doctor was going to get rid of the patients that were driving them crazy and there was going to be a centrally located clinic staffed by two doctors that were going to take care of all the rejects. How they thought they were going to do this is beyond me, but I will tell you by the end of the investigation, one of those two physicians was in jail and the other one had committed suicide. I don't know what they were being offered, but it sure wasn't this, okay? So again, kickbacks, you want to remember, don't get too excited, um, and, and get appropriate legal representation. I'm not talking about your kid brother that just got out of law school, okay? I'm talking about a lawyer who spends a lot of time looking at this part of the law. This is, an, again, an excellent free resource for you. Um, CMS released this, I think it was last year. It's about 34 pages long. It's, a, it's, a, it's called A New Physician's Road Guide to Fraud and Abuse, but all physicians should be looking at this. Very, very good, clear information about what's fraud. I know you don't have to do your own billing, but the kickback portion, I highly recommend it as a great resource for learning more about um, criminal liabilities and billing uh, questions. Stark, kind of like watching paint dry, just so you know, the most boring law that's ever been written. Stark, as you know, says that you cannot refer to any facility that you have any economic interest. Uh, you, you can't make a referral for a designated health service. Um, if you or an immediate family member have any kind of uh, financial relationship. The, 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 it's, the reason for the paintbrush, by the way, is it's a very broad brush law. They deny 
anything, any physician, so all physicians are included in this. A designated health service that keep on adding to over and over, it's basically almost anything at this point in time, inpatient, outpatient, RT, PT, whatever, it's all there. Um, if you or even a family member has a financial relationship with that facility. I love the definition of a family member is my favorite one because it not, it's not just you and your spouse and your kids, it's your mother-in-law. It's even your grandparents-in-law. So they have this huge definition of what constitutes family as well. So this is a very, very broad brush law that's trying to prevent physicians from in any way being financially incentivized to prescribe treatment or make a referral. That's what it's for. Um, there's very, again, all sorts of different kinds of compensation arrangements that could fall under Stark as well. Now, it's, a, it's called a statute of exception, just so you know, and what that means is you can make a very, very broad law, you'd completely forbid an entire activity, self-referral, and then you cut out exceptions. And there's hundreds of them, by the way. So you cut out exceptions, unless it's this, unless it's this. So they have all these exceptions to the law that do allow physician self-referral, but the question is, does your particular activity f meet when those exceptions are not? You only need to have find one exception, that's enough. But it's a, it, it takes um, a lot of threading the needle to see if any particular uh, activity fits into one of the exceptions. This may be intuitive to you, it may not, but just take my word for it. The same behavior could easily create both kickback and stark concerns. One behavior could have both stark and kickback cons considerations, but they are different. Stark is a civil law, there's no jail attached there, but again, they're kind of playing with that with this affirmative duty, but uh, just stark is the civil sign. A kickback is the criminal law. Because it's civil start, you can be in trouble without even knowing that what you're doing is a stark violation. Again, kickback, they're supposed to show some, some level of intent. And stark is actually limited to physician behavior, whereas kickback is anyone. Now, a lot of hospital administrators, when I'm teaching hospital administrators, say, I'm so worried about stark. But when I talk to them, what they're really worried about is kickback. Although, of course, if a, if a hospital wants to have like a freestanding ED, of course, they want to know that it's stark compliant as well, because why would you build something if no one's going to be able to practice there? So anyhow, stark kickback, they're two sides of the same coin, but they're two different animals. You could have a proposed activity that's 100% stark, fine but it's a kickback or vice versa. So you do need to have people who are very well versed in this, lawyers who know a lot about. The good news is you should be one-stop shopping. The same lawyer should be able to answer both stark and kickback questions, but you wanna be very careful not to get into these areas. And now the one that was most, uh, uh, is that a question back? No. Okay, just end of the day, understand, okay. The law that is most, of course, near and dear to your hearts is the one I can probably make easiest. Easiest because I know you're already pretty savvy with this. Um, easy because there's a great resource you probably already know about. And easy because I can, make, I, can do this, I can do this law in five words. I'll show you in a minute. But as you all know, yes, you are all subject to EMTALA because of some very, very vigorous lobbying um, um, based on some bad behavior with patient dumping, particularly uh, a young women who were pregnant and particularly in Dallas. So again, EMTALA has been around for quite a while. As you know, you have to provide a medical, uh, you have to do the medical screening. You have to uh, a pro, uh, a provide stabilizing care. You have to transfer if it's medically appropriate, accept transfers if you're able to do so, if that's medically appropriate. But it's, all, it's way beyond triage. Physicians use the word tri triage is a very different thing. Triage is kind of what room does this patient go into? This is a, EMTALA is much more than just triage. It really requires a more um, intensive uh, a look at a patient. It can't be, um, complaint-driven exam. If the person comes in with a knife sticking out of their foot, the exam can't be ankle down. 
Okay, it has to be a whole body a, a, a review. So again, that's more than triage. But at the end of the day, you're going to do all this without any, any consideration of financial repercussions to you or the hospital. That's what EMTALA really is all about. If you fail to do this, if you, inappropriate, if you don't accept a transfer you're supposed to accept, or you transfer someone who's um, uh, without stabilizing care, or you kick them out without doing that medical screening exam, as you can see, yeah, there's some penalties there. Um, the, the real one, of course, is the Medicare death penalty, getting kicked out of Medicare. I'm surprised how many physicians don't realize there's also penalties for physicians. So for your colleagues in the community that won't come, call, come in when you're calling them in, uh, yeah, there's penalties for them too. And I almost think there's going to have to be more activity, more physicians getting fined for the rest of the medical community to wake up. But I, w I, I think that needs to be stressed because I do know, again, I'm singing to the choir, you're the ones who are making the calls and the people you're asking to come in won't come in. As promised, this is an excellent resource for you, and you know him. Stephen Frew is the lawyer who wrote that book that's weighing down one half your white coat, you know, that, that Entala pocket guide. Um, he, is an, has, he has been the, un, the absolute acknowledged expert, legal expert on Entala for decades. Um, so he's the one who writes those books. By the way, his website is fabulous. He has 20, you might want to do this, or have new ED physicians in your, under, underneath your supervision do this. He has a test, it's 20 scenarios for Imtala. Here's the scenario, what's the answer? Here's a very interesting, all of this is free. So it's a really good Imtala resource for you or for training people who are uh, in your area of supervision. So his uh, website is right there, it's medlaw.com. Buy the book, give him some money, he's been doing good work for a long time. But as I said, that entire law can be made, I don't mean to be simplistic, but it can make it easy. EMTALA boils down to five words, treat all people the same. Any EMTALA question, pick a person you really like. I picked Dustin Hoffman. I decided, who'd, who could hate Dustin Hoffman? So if a patient's coming into your ED and you say, gee, do we have to treat him? Think, well, would I treat it if it's Dustin Hoffman? When the hospital's calling, can you take a transfer? Say, would, would I take that transfer if it was Dustin Hoffman? I used to say Donald Trump, but so many people hate Donald Trump, it doesn't work. I don't want Donald Trump. So think of a lovable person, okay? Because at the end of the day, what they're saying is just treat everyone like you would treat your favorite star, whoever that would be. Do you see what I'm saying? Again, you're, you, that, that is the ultimate sniff test on Amtala. So come up with who's loved in your ED, put a picture of them up on the bulletin board, and anytime there's an Amtala question, go, would you take him or her? All right. That really is, at the end of the day, what Imtala is most importantly about. Now, real quickly, before, while well, I have a couple of minutes, paying physicians to be on call has become endemic, if not across the board. Not everyone is doing it, but if they're doing it in my tiny little town in the middle of Texas, it's pretty much everywhere now. The OIG is the person you never want to meet. The Office of Inspector General, they're the people who are looking for kickbacks, fraud, et cetera. The OIG has looked at this issue of paying physicians for call. Is that or is that not a kickback? Three times now. They did in 2007, they did in 2009, and then they just did again October of 2012. Now, very quickly, when the OIG answers issues an opinion, it is only for educational purposes. It's been complete, it's not disclosed who asked for that opinion, but it is, they're all on the, available for you. You can find them through those resources, uh, those, those citations. But let me summarize what the OIG said. You read that on your own time. Number one, the amount of money being exchanged in all three hospitals who asked, is our plan okay? All three times, the amount of money that was being exchanged for on-call services was pocket change compared to the figures I hear about people, what they're getting to be on-call, sometimes in the thousands of dollars a night. 
So the OIG said in those three very specific uh, uh, situations, yeah, it's okay, but the money was, very, was nominal. Just be, and I keep seeing all these reports all, all over the um, medical journals. It's saying, OIG says paying for on-call is okay. No, they didn't. They said under very specific circumstances, we will pass on this. But all three times, they also said, although this is some pretty thin ice, just so you know. So that was certainly not a blanket acceptance of that practice. It's very clear that the government, if a physician's getting paid to be on call, it better be to answer a documented need in the community like, we have to ship patients to the next town because we can't get orthopedic services here. Whatever, but it has, so it's gotta be that kind of need. And a need, by the way, does not mean answering a physician boycott, all right? It's gotta be a community need that OIG is quite clear about. And it sure cannot be an excuse to give physicians a lot of money to buy loyalty. So yes, the OIG and those three opinions are very readable, not very long and very educational. But you'll see as you go through there, they didn't give a blanket permission at all. They just said under specific circumstances, especially when community need is an issue, you can pay nominal fees for on-call services. And, and that's a question really for your hospital lawyer. I have to put down my microphone because I'm gonna give you a visual, okay? I like visuals. Here's the bottom line. Physician happiness directly related to liability, okay? I promise you, if people are getting paid enough that they're really happy about being on call, everyone probably should be worried. So again, this is getting increased. And I know you're on the other side. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to get paid that amount of money to be in the ED every night, right? So I know that, I, again, I'm, it's, it's your colleagues on the other side. But just know that there's been a lot of looking at this, and it could possibly change uh, in the near future. I have just run out of time. I got flashing zeros. Thank you, Sherry, again, for letting me go back to back on my two programs. But most of all, thank you for introducing me to this audience. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you to all of you. I wish you nothing but the best. I don't think we have time for that.